All right. So I'm I'm Bill Hallman from Rutgers University. Uh, as was introduced, my areas of expertise are on, on uh, risk perception and risk communication. And uh, it's worth noting that I'm a psychologist and I understand and I study how people understand food safety risks. And so I've been given about 20 minutes to share everything I know about how to do effective communication of food safety risk to, commu uh, to consumers. So um, let's go ahead and get started. All right. Um, and you've seen me change my, my slide, yes? Thank you. All right. So one of the, the key points is that if what we're trying to do is change beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors, it's going to require more than just education. It's going to require simply, it's going to require more than simply giving people facts. Well, there are lots of reasons why, and we could spend the rest of the afternoon talking about why uh, education is simply not enough. But you know, one of the key ones, key uh, issues, is that there is this basic knowledge behavior gap. Uh, essentially, knowing what to do is a necessary but not sufficient condition to get people to take action. For example, many of us know that training people to engage in safe food preparation uh, practices does not guarantee that they will put those practices into action, or they will put those practices into action for a short period of time uh, and then go back to their um, you know, previously poor food safety practices that they began with, in part because doing it right takes extra time, extra effort, perhaps extra expense, and they're not necessarily seeing um, you know, the, the, the consequences of their particular actions. So knowing what to do is important, but it's simply not enough to get people to take action. Indeed, changing behavior requires a couple of things. For people to change their behaviors, they have to be convinced, first of all, that they're at risk, or they're putting others that they care about at risk. That is, that they're vulnerable and are likely to be exposed to whatever the food safety hazard is. They have to be clear that the consequences are worth avoiding, that if they're exposed to whatever the food safety issue is, it's going to be problematic for them, and so it's worth them taking some sort of action to avoid it. They also need to know what to do and when to do it. They also have to believe that they've got the necessary skills, equipment, and other resources to do it. They have to be convinced that their efforts are going to be effective in reducing their risk, so it's worth it to them. And their new behaviors have to be considered normal and are being practiced by others. There's a social component to this as well, particularly if we're teaching people how to practice good food safety behaviors in front of others. So one of the things that we need to consider beyond simply telling people what it is that they need to do is what additional things do they need you know, what infrastructure, tools, equipment, other physical resources are going to be required to carry out these new or improved practices and to consider where those resources would come from, because not everybody has the resources that they need to do these new things and who has the ability to make them happen. If we're talking about changing food safety behaviors, you know, in a company, for example, the employees need to know what to do but their bosses need to know that they need to supply what's required for the employees to make it happen. Um, so, you know, what behaviors need to be changed to carry out these improved practices? Sometimes we need to supply some incentives for people to engage in these new behaviors. We also have to consider what barriers there are to adopting those particular behaviors. You know, I know that this is going to be seem kind of obvious, but we need to be clear about our goals. It's important to note that education is not the same thing as persuasion. That, again, education is necessary. Knowing what to do is, in, is a first step, but it isn't necessarily going to lead to behavior change. So one of the things it's important is for you to be clear about whether you're trying to educate people, where they get to make up their minds about whether you know, they're going to engage in this particular practice, or you're trying to persuade them to engage in a particular practice or to change their minds or their attitudes. It's important to make this clear to your audiences, what it is you're trying to do. 
Are you trying to give them the information and let them decide? Or have you decided yourself what is the right thing to do and you're going to persuade them to go along? If your intent is to persuade, it's important that you say so. Indeed, the research in psychology shows that saying you're going to try to persuade someone is a lot more effective than sort of denying that you're trying to persuade some, someone simply by giving them the facts. And if your goal is to persuade, um, say why you're trying to persuade. One of the key things is people uh, are sensitive to motivations. Why are you trying to persuade me to do this particular thing? In whose interest is it that I do this thing or I change my mind about this issue? Um, not surprisingly, as somebody who studies perception of risk, I think it's really important to understand how people perceive risk in order to effectively communicate about risks. It's important to note that perception is indeed reality, that people act or fail to act based on what they believe is true, not on what may be objectively true. Doesn't matter what the science says, what matters is what they think is true. Uh, it's important also to note that risk perception is comprised of two things, both thinking and feeling. So there are cognitive components, you know, thoughts about how or why a food safety hazard poses a threat, what are the consequences of that threat, what can be done about it, and the social context surrounding that particular hazard. And then individual perceptions of vulnerability, self-efficacy, do I have what I need, can I do what I've learned? Um, and, you know, is my action going to be effective in reducing the threat itself? Then there are affective components, which are feelings. So feelings of fear or worry or sadness or frustration in response to the particular threat. What's important to note is while many psychologists and economists think that cognition comes first, that first we think and then we feel, I think our own um, you know, lived, be, lived lives indicate that often we feel first and then we think. You know, we sort of have a gut reaction and then we think about why we feel the way that we do. Um, please do note that most of the food safety messages we put out there rely on cognition. They rely on thinking, relying, rely on giving facts. You know, you're familiar with, with many of these things, um, you know, clean, separate, cook, chill, five keys to safer food, these sorts of things. You know, we're constantly trying to persuade people using facts. However, activist messages or advocates mess messages often rely simply on affect. Um, you know, rather than necessarily giving the steps to safer food, we're, you know, they're basically saying, if you don't wash your hands after using the bathroom, you're a disgusting human being. That's affect. That's not cognition. The key is that we need to use both cognition and affect. Risk perception is a mix of facts and feelings, intellect and instinct, reason and gut reaction. Um, you know, risk communication has to address each of these particular influences. And I'd also like to emphasize that much of the task of food safety risk communication involves making the invisible visible. When you think about it, you know, most of the foodborne contaminants of concern are not visible to the naked eye. So when we're concerned about bacteria and viruses, parasites, toxic chemicals, allergens, other sorts of food contaminants, it's just not possible for the people we're speaking to to know that these things are present by themselves. They have to rely on other things. Indeed, not just the risks, but most of the foodborne benefits we're looking for are also invisible. You can't see the micronutri micronutrients or the macronutrients or the calories or the vitamins or minerals, et cetera, without some indication on the label that those things are present in the food in the package. So the in implication of this is that we really need to rely on other trusted information to make the invisible visible. Again, things like ingredient labels, health claims, date codes, um, proxy visual information, taste and smell, you know, some basic rules, um, you know, to, to basically understand what it is that we're dealing with. 
The key problem of invisibility for food safety is that we typically rely on visual and olfactory cues to know what is safe and what is not. So how does it look and how does it smell? Indeed, our research into how people think about bacteria and viruses is that many people believe that if hands and surfaces, fabrics, utensils, and equipment look clean, it means that there are no bacteria. So if it looks clean, it is clean. There's also a, uh, a problem that spoilage bacteria, which are responsible for bad taste and odors, um, are not a reliable indicator of pathogenic bacteria, which are responsible for foodborne illness. Now, both bacteria live in similar conditions, but the fact that it smells good doesn't necessarily mean that there are no pathogenic bacteria. Uh, one of the things I do is work on foodborne illness outbreaks and food recalls, and people will often use the sniff test as a potential indicator as to whether the product they have has been affected um, in an outbreak. Um, and it's just not a reliable indicator itself. So the sniff test is inadequate. People don't understand that spoilage bacteria are not the same thing as pathogenic bacteria. And so if they rely on the sniff test, they may be misleading themselves. We need to help people understand that. The key thing is without these external cues, it's really easy for people to ignore or to amplify the objective risks. Um, the package of Seton Farm pistachios in the corner is a reminder that, and you can probably see the top corner is cut. I was eating this package of pistachios uh, when I got a call from the local supermarket indicating that I had purchased a package of pistachios that was part of a food recall. You know, I'm sort of in the business and there was no way for me to know that there was potentially a problem um, with salmonella in these particular pistachios. So the, the issue is that one of the things we need to do for food safety communication is to make the invisible visible for people. Another key issue for us is that people don't know what they don't know. And when people don't know what they don't know, they're unlikely to seek information. It's important to note that only about a third of Americans have a college degree. And for most Americans, science education stops at the high school level. So think about what you learned in grade school and high school about science. Think about what you learned about microbiology prior to college. And often it's not a significant amount. Also worth noting, the number of people or the percentage of people who have degrees from, uh, from college varies across the United States. So it will depend on you know, where you live, what your, the makeup of your audience might actually be in terms of their background in science. Indeed, you know, lots of studies out there showing that many people lack critical science knowledge. And it's not just science facts, it's also problems with numeracy and chart reading. So being able to extract information from, uh, from graphs, um, from complex scientific uh, presentations, and a real problem understanding scientific processes. So the key thing is we can't rely on people having a background in science um, and sort of putting the pieces together for themselves. We have to put the pieces together for them and to make the conclusions really, really clear. Again, people don't know what they don't know. Um, on the food side, increasing urbanization means fewer people around the world are involved with agriculture. We know that food safety education in schools in the United States is inadequate. We've kind of given up on home economics. Uh, food safety is very poorly demonstrated on TV shows. If you look at any of the cooking competition shows, you know, routinely they are engaging in really poor food safety pra practices, which makes it seem as though that's normal. And if you look at recipes, um, even published recipes rarely include decent food safety information. You know, we're lucky or we're privileged if the recipes contain uh, safe temperature, safe cooking temperatures. Even beyond that, you know, how to safely store food, how to reheat it, um, you know, how long you can store it just isn't present in most recipes. So we're not doing a good job of 
teaching people what they need to know about food safety. Our studies also show that people know very little about foodborne illness. They underestimate the incidence of foodborne illness. They can't identify the groups of people particularly at risk for foodborne illness. And they can't actually identify the symptoms of foodborne illness, even when they experience it themselves. Indeed, um, our recent study in 2018, you know, we found that while the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention show that one in six Americans get sick each year from foodborne illness, only a third of the people we uh, interviewed in 2018 reported that they had ever had food poisoning, which is a statistical impossibility. We've all likely had some bout of food poisoning, whether we recognized it or not. The key is people are not recognizing it. And when we did ask the third who said that they had had food poisoning, um, almost nine in 10 thought that what made them sick was actually prepared by someone other than themselves. It was somebody else's fault, you know, not their actions that led to their illness. This leads to another key point, which is that indeed that there is a lack of feedback loops in uh, when foodborne illness happens. You know, typically it's blamed on somebody else. Um, many all, people also believe that the symptoms of foodborne illness become evident shortly after eating a tainted food. So you have something for lunch and then you immediately feel bad. Um, they don't understand that the incubation period can be, you know, days. Uh, and so it wasn't what I ate, what I prepared myself last night. It's what I had at the cafeteria for lunch that made me sick. The key thing is that because there is this lack of food of feedback loops and people don't really understand how foodborne illness works, they don't typically connect their actions with the consequences. This is a problem when we're trying to help home cooks do a better job of practicing food safety it's also a problem for food service because you prepare the food, others get sick, and you never hear that those other people got sick. Uh, I'd like you to understand that mental models matter. So this is your mantra for the day. Mental models matter, mental models matter, mental models matter. We can't know everything. And indeed, we often, as human beings, have an incomplete mental model of how things work or why. We then fill our mental models of how the world works with available information that's plausible and connects with what we think we already know. We also understand from research that much of what people know about microbiology is rooted in popular culture. And studies suggest that a lot of what people know about bacteria and viruses in particular come from advertisements for consumer products, including toothpaste, mouthwash, and household cleaners. Indeed, you know, during the COVID pandemic, we saw lots of advertisements for cleaning products that promised to, you know, to kill uh, the COVID virus and other sorts of things. So one of the ways that we learn uh, about bacteria and viruses is through these kinds of products rather than, you know, on the internet or uh, through formal education. So the key thing about mental models is that people lack many of the basic scientific details. They're unlikely to pick them up through formal education. Um, and yet we do develop mental models that help us navigate the world, that provide a basis for understanding and perceptions of how things work, of whether they're safe, under what circumstances they may be useful and safe. And again, these perceptions are largely based on the information we encounter in the world around us. Sadly, we also know from psychology and from personal experience that once people make up their minds, it's difficult to get them to change. In psychology and, and other social sciences, this goes by a number of different names. Today, we're gonna go with the term motivated reasoning. And essentially, this is a summary of a number of ideas. That is, once we've decided something, or once we have done something, we look for and readily incorporate new information that's consistent with our beliefs or what we've done or our identities. We'll reject information that's inconsistent with those. 
And when we cannot reject new information that's inconsistent with our beliefs, our actions, or identities, we'll twist it in ways to make it consistent. Moreover, once we've made up our minds, we tend to reject or resent those who try to correct us. So, you know, often what we're trying to do in presenting information about better food safety practices is trying to correct these mental models. And we've all had the experience of people kind of rejecting these ideas. Um, and a special topic, and I wish we had the rest of the day to talk about this, you know, often what we're trying to do is correct misinformation. And it's important to note that misinformation only has to be intuitively plausible to be accepted. So you can't counter every piece of misinformation that's out there. So when thinking about what it is that you need to counter, focus on the plausibility. Focus on the plausibility of the lie itself or the misinformation itself and the potential influence of the liar or the person spreading the misinformation. The more plausible the information, the more you need to focus on it. And the greater the reach of the person spreading the information, again, may give you some priorities. The keys to plausibility, again, think about mental models. It's plausible if the information fits with or confirms what you already know or believe or who you believe you are. It may be plausible if it provides a mechanism for an association you already believe exists. It kind of explains things for you. Or it connects metaphorically or analogously to a mechanism or relationship you already believe exists, or critically delivers a simple explanation for a complex phenomenon. You know, explains why um, your mental model works itself. So the key to plausibility is to think about people's starting points. What are they likely to already believe? And does this provide an easy explanation for what they may be seeing? For example, um, you know, we wash our produce. Why wouldn't we rinse our chicken? Um, by analogy. And of course, we know that we're teaching people not to wash their chickens now. But it kind of makes sense that they would do that. So when we're uh, trying to effectively communicate about food safety information, it's important to understand that we need to go beyond the deficit model. The deficit model is if people just understood the facts, they would do the right thing. Indeed, communicating the facts is important and a good first step, but it's only effective typically in the absence of information because people resist or resent being told that they are wrong. If we're going to engage with people, um, a couple of key things. Number one, don't be a jerk. If you're going to correct someone, do it nicely. Our beliefs are essential to our identities. And sometimes persuading someone to change their mind or their behavior isn't the only goal. You're in this for the long run. So you want to build or maintain relationships with people. You want to establish or maintain your authority and usefulness as an expert in the area. So be careful in how you correct people. You know, clearly don't get into arguments. Don't engage trolls on the, on the internet. It's a waste of time and often counterproductive. Honestly, I'm giving you permission to walk away. Uh, if you can't convince people, it's okay. Stop. Give it up. You know, go to people who are more receptive. Think about whether your goal is to correct facts or conclusions. A lot of the nonsense that's out there is not in the form of isolated facts. It's more likely a network of unsupported arguments that leads to a false or inaccurate conclusion. So think, is your goal to fact check, to correct particular facts, to debunk overall arguments, or to challenge uh, conclusions? And then finally, you know, think about the goal of misinformation itself. A lot of the information that's out there is meant is not meant to inform people, but to create an emotional reaction, to get you to click, to get you to share, to get you to act. And in fact, you know, there's no guarantee that correcting that misinformation is going to do anything about the emotional reaction that people have. And then, as I say, finally, you know, think about the underlying concerns that the misinformation expresses. Simply correcting information does not necessarily address the concern that is being expressed. Think about what underlies that particular, uh, that particular concern. So what values are being expressed? 
connecting with values. We all want to have safe food. We all want to protect others. We all want to protect children. And that's often a valuable first step. We agree on these particular values. Now, you know, this is how to achieve that particular objective that we both agree on. So um, that's a lot in 20 minutes. If you'd like to have more information, this is where you can find me. Um, and I am actually part of Rutgers Cooperative Extension. It's part of my job to be useful. So don't be shy about reaching out. So thanks very much.